Greetings, spiritual warriors. Hare Krishna. We greet you with love. Because the more love is coming, the more I read from this Spiritual Warrior 2 book that we're working from. Uh, it's called Transforming Lust into Love by His Holiness Bhakti Tirta Swami. I want to welcome spiritual warriors who have been coming, and I want to welcome anyone new here for the first time. We're going to deal with, talk about spiritual warriorship. We're discussing from spiritual warrior books by His Holiness Bhakti Tirta Swami. He has six spiritual warrior books. All are available at Krishna.com store. So I hope you're getting them and so you can kind of follow me unless you're making notes. I want to give you an idea what he says about spiritual warriorship because the whole idea of this program is titled Spiritual Warriorship. And his idea behind the series, as I said, six of spiritual warrior books is for us to trust and tune into the concept of spiritual warriorship and use it in a positive way. When you think of warriors in war, you know, it just came to my mind, you know, going after somebody or, of course, more recent now, dropping bombs, shooting guns or something. But we're talking about spiritual warriorship, and I want you to remember the word spiritual because what I'm finding as I read, this is what this is about <clears throat> excuse me but his idea behind the spiritual warrior books as I said and I plan to try and repeat till we get this ingrained in our consciousness is for us to get the idea of spiritual warrior as a positive aspect and his presentations of spiritual warrior is to help us help us what help us become grounded in understanding who we are as spiritual beings. First step. Who we are as spiritual beings. Also, to help us cope with life in trying times. And, of course, if you read the headlines, there's no doubt about that. But spiritual warriors are able to cope with life and trying times as they follow the instructions and techniques and technologies given. Spiritual warrior books are also to help us use spiritual weapons to battle the tide of depression, anxiety, and feelings of hopelessness sweeping through our society and also to help us develop an internal positive dialogue for making the mind our friend. That sounds pretty powerful, doesn't it? Just come along with me and we'll see how we can begin to ex establish those things. Bhakti Tirta Swami also states and gives this definition of the true spiritual warrior strives to master the weapons of love we're going to talk about that tonight humility one of the 12 qualities compassion another of the 12 qualities of a spiritual warrior faith another quality of the spiritual warrior and self knowledge and what is that self knowledge to know who we really are and that has been mentioned as a part of the process. And to have self-knowledge and realize that our battleground is in the realm of human consciousness. Change doesn't come about. Any action we want to take, it has to be established. We establish it in our consciousness that this is how we're going to be or this is what we're going to do. And that's the whole idea. So that's what it's about, and he, this is to help us really get to a point where we begin to know who we really are, who God is, and our connection 
and how we can ultimately reach the highest element, which is love of God, and eventually go back to Godhead, which he brings out quite frequently. So last week we read from um, the chapter 2 of Spiritual Warrior 2, What is Love? And I want to do a quick review, brief review. I'm going to do a review. Knowing me and how I get carried away sometimes may not be brief. But I want to do a review and then we'll finish the chapter tonight. But there's a word I want you to be alert to. I found it as I reviewed and went through. He uses it quite often. The word is genuine. He speaks of genuine love. And we can get a sense of what it is. But I went to the dictionary and genuine that I found says, gave two, sincerely and honestly felt or experienced. Sincerely and honestly felt and experienced. And the other, free from hypocrisy or pretense. Genuine. So listen for that word as we go through. So what did we talk about last week? What is love? He states, all of us want to be loved with unconditional eternal love. A love that sees beyond beauty, intelligence, or any other superficial quality. This preoccupation with love arises because in reality we are eternal loving beings whose souls are filled with knowledge and bliss. In this physical embodiment, we are temporarily covered by material energy, but our nature is inherently divine. Okay, just grasp it. He's bringing us up out of material consciousness to a higher level of consciousness by these words. And we are also, and all, excuse me, always seeking the blissful love of the spiritual kingdom where our real fulfillment lies. Huh? Did you know that's what's going on in you? Yearning for love and wanting love. It's the soul within. He states, though, the problem arises because we're looking for answers in all the wrong places. We have forgotten the spiritual dimension of life. A society without a spiritual nucleus lacks the cosmic glue he has that in quote to make everything work love is the cosmic glue that holds us together as we learn to know and relate to one another and ultimately to the Supreme Personality of God. So love, it says, as we relate to each other, we learn and we know what that relationship is ultimately for us to love the Supreme Personality of God. Now he states, modern society seems to have forgotten this. Ah. That even may sound strange. But deep down, even though the experience of love often eludes us, we know that love is our birthright. We want it, we know it's available but we're not quite able to grasp it. So what do we do? We substitute something else. 
hoping to find happiness in wealth, prestige, and power. But he says, let's look now deeply at how this works by first examining what love is not. Love is not about getting something. Mm. Love is not about getting something. And here's the first use of this word, genuine. He says, genuine love is not concerned with personal gain, but rather with the quality of the exchange between those involved. When we think only of ourselves, trying to arrange matters to get what we want, we're not expressing love. Unconditional love is never based on trying to receive anything. Instead, it is an experience of giving and a joyful activity in which each participant strives to share more generously than the other. He says, this point is particularly relevant for a society that frequently equates love with sex. Practically every major effort to influence our consciousness is based upon trying to entice us our, our sec, entice us sexually. Unfortunately, this attempt to enslave human civilization is succeeding all too well. Consequently, people focus outwardly and do not attribute value to knowing each other or themselves. In fact, because they cannot get beyond the body game, their consciousness remains enslaved and subject to physical passion. Love, he goes on further, love has nothing to do with exploitation. It's not a business deal or an accounting system that requires the actions of one person to be balanced by those of another. Instead, love expresses genuine concern for the well-being of others. He goes on, the next love is not a feeling. Mm, what do you mean? I feel good. When I love her, I feel. Ah, it's not a feeling. Let's see what that means. Now, he says, which <laughs> most of us consider love to be a feeling that ebbs and flows according to the circumstances. Huh? Love you today. You can give me what I want. Don't love you today. Don't love you. Hey, come back, maybe. But genuine love, there's that word again. We must keep that. The meaning genuine, free from hypocrisy or pretense. Hmm? Sincerely and honestly felt or experienced. Genuine love is not linked to what we feel, nor does it depend on any external conditions. Real love is divine and cannot exist separately from the source, which is God. You see, remember before, the ultimate was the supreme loving, the supreme personality of God. 
He's telling us again, the source is God. It's the connection, the cosmic glue. We have to have God in the center of whatever. He states, love is not something we can turn off and on like a faucet. Hmm? <laughs> in our society, we often do not understand this. A man and a woman may make marital vows and then change their minds in a few months or years. In such a state of consciousness, we are constantly looking for something outside of ourselves instead of tapping the wellspring of love within. He says, when we are genuinely loving, we are not concerned with ourselves at all. Love is a verb, he says. We empathize, we appreciate, we share, and we give. We're not trying to feel good or control the environment to enhance our own pleasure. It's a wonderful perspective to really, because as he says, we all want love, and we want to give love. And this, for me, is helping clarify if you're really, really understanding. Next he says, love is not always pleasant. And I guess I'll hear an amen or hallelujah to that. Since love is not defined by our ple pleasant feelings, we just said, you know, love is not a feeling. <laughs> Pain can be an integral part of love. Although most of us would prefer to experience happiness and eliminate pain from our relationships, this attitude is based on a desire to satisfy our senses. Mm. Genuine love, there's that word again, sincerely and honestly felt and experienced, free from hypocrisy and pretense. I keep bringing that up to help clarify my mind as far as loving. Genuine love can indeed bring us great happiness. Yet, it can also cause extreme suffering. Let's see, nodding, yeah, yeah, right. But he says, it's like a paradox. That love, the most healing force there is, can also make us so vulnerable to pain. When we care about someone, the hard times are wonderful because they demonstrate the need for greater communication. Mm. Greater communication. Communi good communication is important in whatever relationship. Even if you go to the doctor and you have questions, if you can communicate your question and he can communicate an answer, there's some clarity there and you don't go away confused. But hear what he says. When we care about someone, the hard times are wonderful. Mm. What are you talking about? The hard times are wonderful because they demonstrate the need For greater communication because our partner did not receive our words or actions in a loving spirit we see a need for love this gives us an exciting opportunity to serve and to support the well-being of the other person how about that 
exciting opportunity. Okay? So the next time it ain't going right, and about pointing a finger, oh, you no. See it as an exciting opportunity. It can bring about a change, right? Hey, what's wrong with you? I'm telling you you're wrong and you're looking happy, a happy opportunity. But this is getting another insight and vision into this love that we all want, we all have, and we want to give and share. Gives the, I like this. This gives us an exciting opportunity to serve and support the well-being of the other person. It states, our goal as spiritual warriors, this is what we're on the path as spiritual warriors, our goal as spiritual warriors is to become so loving that nothing seems to bother us. In this state, we will not be affected by negativity at all. Instead, we will be grateful for negative comments as well as praise and may even interpret harsh words in a loving way. How often when things aren't going well in a relationship, you think about an exciting opportunity or these hard times are wonderful. It's not a changing consciousness. I just stop and look at that. At first, he says, this may seem naive. Yeah, you're saying, right. You don't know what he said. You don't know what she did. But actually, such behavior reflects strong faith in the Lord. Strong faith in the Lord. What we just put. And Bill, if you're following 12 qualities, one of them is firm faith. See how it, those qualities are used constantly. That's why I hope you imbibe them and are putting the work in your life. Such behavior reflects strong faith in the Lord and a willingness, willingness to share our faith and love with others. All of us actually have the capacity to become so fixed in our love that everything in the environment only helps us to be more loving this is the mood of a spiritual warrior. And what does that come back to? As he keeps mentioning the importance of having the Lord in the center, that the ultimate is to love the supreme personality of God. And as you work on that in your spiritual life, he goes on. Jealousy and envy are not love. And this is a wonderful example he gives those of us who are in a spiritual environment. However, even in spiritual circles, people often do not understand how to love one another. I'm hearing an amen to that. Keep listening. Because we have to look at ourselves. Even if there's an amen to that. Yeah, you're right. You have to look at yourself because we're going to find out later what goes around, comes around. Despite a seeming commitment to a spiritual lifestyle, individuals may experience envy and jealousy at their peers. For example, if one person is advancing spiritually, others who are trapped in material consciousness may be unable to feel happiness for that individual. Instead, they become jealous and mean-spirited. 
you notice is that trapped in material consciousness. And what we're doing here is endeavoring to get to a spiritual consciousness. He says, I'm remembering this, this is a review, I want to read the whole book, everything, just each time I read it, it's like new and exciting to grasp, but he says, we should remember that whenever we feel sad, disturbed, and envious of another's success, we are on qualified for the blessings of spiritual life. In these circumstances, we must work on ourselves to dissolve our selfish motivations so that eventually we can reach the points of being happy and enthusiastic for the accomplishment of others. We are always enhanced rather than diminished by another's growth. Spiritual life requires great intensity, strong faith, and firm conviction. Now, that we, now that we have seen what love is not, let us look more closely at what love is and where it come from, comes from. The origin of love can only be found in a place far beyond this material world. In fact, deep love cannot exist independently from the Supreme Lord. Deep love cannot exist independently from the Supreme Lord because he is the source and storehouse of everything. Those who lay claim to love without a connection with the Godhead may think they have valuable diamonds but are actually in possession of cut glass. What love is? Unconditional love is spiritual. Unconditional love then is beyond material concerns. It exists in a realm that transcends the mind and the body and is related to the nature of the soul. He gives a, a story here, a short story I want to share with you. Call it, it's called The Gathering of the Sages. But the introduction is this, it goes along. He says, with all of the Hollywood depiction of sentimental love so prevalent in our mechanized society, many of us have difficulty understanding the true meaning of spiritual love. Huh? That's a fact. When last of you been to the movies, huh? He came home and said, oh, she don't love me like that. He don't love me like that. Why can't I do it? They look so happy. That's the body game. He's talking and we're talking about spiritual love and yet a relationship with each other. We have little opportunity, he says, to go beyond a bodily relationship or to view others as anything but extensions of ourselves. 
these approaches to love are so pervasive that they often affect our attitude towards God. Why? Because, he says, we have a tendency to think of the Lord as someone who can fulfill our personal desires. And so we have no interest in serving him selflessly in an unmotivated, unconditional way. This is the story, Srimad Bhagavatam, an ancient and extremely sacred scripture. It describes an assembly of yogis and great mystics from many different paths who assembled long ago in a forest in India known as Namishrayana. They came together to address this question. What is the highest human activity? These yogis were eager to discover the most expedient process for attaining the highest level of spiritual development. They were prepared to stay together and ponder the question for years, if necessary until they could come to a satisfactory conclusion. Despite the fact they came from many different traditions, they all shared the common goal of wanting to experience the greatest spiritual truths. And that needs to be our desire in this time, in this age. The seekers at the assembly had a deep level of sincerity. Thus, they questioned a very special pure devotee of the Lord by the name of Sutta Goswami, who was completely selfless and unmotivated. In any spiritual gathering, the sincerity of both the speaker and of the audience are extremely important. What eventually emerged from the meeting was the understanding that spirituality is never a matter of one creed or dogma versus another. The sage did not dwell on such temporary conceptions, nor did he imply that one teaching was higher than any other. Instead, he spoke of the importance of knowledge. What is knowledge? Knowing who you are, who God is, and your relationship with God. Service. And what does that mean? In this knowledge, you know you are a servant of God. You're serving him and you serve his parts and parcels because he's also in every other entity. And love of God beyond any externals. Explaining that love and service form the true foundation for self-realization, love and service. When we love God unconditionally, we do not pray for relief from anxiety, distress, and frustration. Such prayers are not indicative of high level of devotion. Instead, we need to learn how to share our love by offering unmotivated, uninterrupted service. He says, love is unmotivated 
service. <laughs> Love is far from sweet sounding words. Love only becomes real through our behavior. But I have to add sweet sounding words to help. Huh? Hey babe, how you doing? Please send my babe. That was a sweet sounding word. But it, it, it encourages. But it has to also have behavior, positive behavior, loving behavior behind the words. We express our love by what we do. If someone professes love for another but is unwilling to serve that person, the love is not deep. It is theoretical and not genuine. There's that word again. Free, genuine, free from hypocrisy or pretense. If we do not determine, demonstrate our love by dynamic activity, something is wrong. The deeper the love, the more we will express it by selfless service to the object of our love. This understanding of love as service is fundamental to all major world religions. Although these religions differ superficially in many respects, they are united around one central point. True religion means service to God. Whatever we call ourselves, Christian, Jew, Muslim, Buddhist, or Hindu, is not particularly significant nor are the rituals we perform. Behind all the exterior practices is the fact that each religious path has come into being to provide us with specific ways to love and serve God. Just that sentence for me, I read, I've read it many times, but it, it it gives us, me at the moment, a sense of how the Supreme God, God have we been talking about, loves us all. And understanding our consciousness and where it is arranges, if you will, different paths that will eventually lead to him but has to develop different paths so that we'll have in a particular path a specific way to love and serve God. And if we do that genuinely, sincerely, it leads to the ultimate goal, love of God and returning back to God. Ooh, this is really, I'm, if I read this again, I may just float out of here. Mm -hmm. Okay. And we mentioned service. He says, service is natural. We are always serving someone or something. Can't deny that, right? And those who love one another understandably want to express their love through service. That is why what is it? The golden rule. What is the golden rule? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. Hmm? We forget that sometimes, especially if we get angry or something isn't going right. We think, oh, I'll get even. It's not about getting even. When we see ourselves as servants of the beloved, we seek to please the other as a spontaneous expression of our love. We are indifferent to praise or blame. 
But unfortunately, although we may try to serve enthusiastically, our motivation is often impure. We want to be recognized and appreciated. We must learn to serve willingly, even in the absence of any reciprocation or acknowledgement. That sounds pretty rough. Hard, right, maybe. Why? Of course I should be appreciated. I do this, I do that. True. But what I'm getting from this, if you're on the spiritual path, you're working on your spiritual life, he told us we have to do that, and you are understanding, again, who you are, who God is, your relationship with God, and your purpose here in this human body is to serve, and you're a servant. And you continue developing that, then with a sense of that identity, we can serve willingly, even in the absence of reciprocation or acknowledgement, because if you know your connection with God and you're serving God, and you know that this God loves us and God reciprocates to your loving and serving him, you will feel the sense of connectedness and whether you get the external reciprocation or acknowledgement, you'll be all right. You can serve willingly, he says. We should remember that the way we treat others is actually the way we are treating ourselves. Ooh, okay. Because everything eventually comes back to us. What is that? What goes around comes around? I think everybody knows that expression. Huh? Is that what he's saying here? Everything eventually comes back to us. And this goes back. What did we say? Do unto others as you would have others do unto you. If these, this, this is knowledge. This is understanding. If you keep that, then you'll be more mindful of what you're saying to another person, how you're treating another person. Why do some people always have so much help and care? Because they give it. And therefore, it returns to them in kind. Why is it that no one trusts those who do not trust others? Because that distrustful energy is coming full circle back to them. We have to be careful of what we do, how we think, why? Because our thoughts and actions set forces in motion to bring the results back to us. This gives some food for thought, doesn't it? Just think about after this program, whenever. How are things going? Not too happy about what's happening in the exchange? Are you careful of what you do and how you think? Because our thoughts and actions set forces in motion to bring results back to us. Remember we used an expression, as within, so without. So again, it's like the ball keeps coming back to our court, doesn't it? If you're not happy with what's going on out there, rather than point fingers, you, what they say, you point at one and three are pointing back at you. You can understand that. So it means self-work. We can test ourselves, he says, by doing a favor anonymously for someone we really care about. Generally, when we offer a gift, we send a card, 
identifying ourselves as the giver and implying that we expect some measure of recognition for our generosity. Hmm, hadn't thought of it that way. Obviously, this is not selfless. Unconditional behavior because it is based on self-glorification. Hmm. We can only pass the test of selfless, unmotivated service when we help someone without seeking praise. Happy simply in the knowledge that we have taken the right action. So the next, and we're coming to the end of this chapter, becoming transcendental. When we genuinely serve another person with unconditional love, we are surrendering to the will of God. We are setting our personal interests aside and doing the necessary, no matter what the cost. Because of our love, we do not react even when someone is critical or angry. We just find a more tactful way to accomplish our service. We go on being humble. Quality, spiritual quality, number two, humility, wonderful. Lord Chaitanya, humbler than a blade of grass. That's an important quality. Because of our love, we do not react even when someone is critical or angry. This is becoming transcendental. Huh? We're going above the material consciousness. We just find a more tactful way to accomplish our service. We go on being humble, which means being concerned about others and making even better arrangements for them than we would for ourselves because we love them even more than ourselves. This is genuine, unconditional love. He says, such steadfast behavior means we are becoming transcendental instead of remaining merely sentimental. We're sentimental when we are attached to feeling good, to maintaining peace at all costs, or to tolerating the misdeeds of others in order to avoid their displeasure. It's a good definition of sentimentality. This is a form of sense enjoyment that is a hindrance to spiritual life. As we have seen, real love is not based on wanting to feel good mentally, psychologically, or physically. The focus of such a superficial approach is egocentric because we are just using a relationship even with God to get what we want. We become transcendental when we rise above the material state of affairs and the platform of everyday mediocrity. We elevate ourselves by keeping our focus clear, persevering. That's another quality of the spiritual warrior, perseverance. 
persevering in our spiritual practices. You must have spiritual practices. You must have some discipline in your spirit for your spiritual life. And passing our daily tests. We do not allow obstacles such as our own senses or those of others to stand in our way. Now, you may be having great, what, well, am I going to live like that? What are you talking about? That's a, no, no. It's available. And he still continues to clarify, I feel. Love does not always mean that we maintain contact with another person or that we are gentle and kind. Sometimes we must go away or speak harsh words. Mm. But such actions are soft to the heart because the motivation is selfless. If we're capable of real love, we do not stop loving others even if we decide to be abrupt or stop associating with them. Despite appearances, our first priority should always be for their highest good. And again, it's back to the spiritual life, spiritual practicing, practices, knowing that the Lord God is in our heart. He's in everybody's heart. And as even if we move away from them or have to leave, or as he says, use harsh words, we, we also still respect the God in them. Again, he's reminding us as spiritual warriors, we should always seek to raise the energy level around us. When we practice upgrading our surroundings, we progress quickly because we're radiating divinity. We're divine beings, eternal beings, and love wherever we go. According to the laws of karma, Whatever we give to others, we will receive back in kind. And that's not new news, right? We know that. But do we remember that when we get ready to lash out? Therefore, the more love we give, the more we will experience. Ah, here it is. This brings us to the subject of empowerment. Although we may want to help others, we may not believe that we have sufficient love to give. And you may be thinking, I'd sure like to do that, but whoa, how will I ever get there? In this situation, the Lord dwelling in our hearts can respond to our call, empowering us to serve beyond our normal capacities. Hmm. The Lord in the heart just spoke about it. He hears your cry. He sees you wanting to love more. He sees you wanting to serve more. And he responds to your call. And he empowers you to serve beyond what you even think you can do. Indeed, highly spiritual people do not rely solely upon their own intelligence or their normal understanding. Their deep, genuine, Commitment brings unlimited love, knowledge, and realization beyond their own personal limitations. That is why when we become receptive to God's help, miracles start to happen. 
and we're going to end with this last section called daily life is a training ground <laughs> The sages and yogis at the gathering described in Srimad Bhagavatam town understood by the mercy of Sutta Goswami that love was based on unmotivated service to God. They realized that genuine spirituality meant becoming servants of everyone. The same is true for us. In everyday life, our relationships with one another can, are practice for the divine relationships we will eventually experience. the quality of our interactions indicate how well we are preparing ourselves for association with the Supreme Lord. The quality of our interactions indicate how well we are preparing ourselves for association with the Supreme Lord. That is why association with others who are serious about spiritual life is so important. Through these experiences, we are learning to love and serve the Supreme. And as we said earlier, that is the ultimate goal of being in this material world, in this material body. The last, we're closing with this. The highest level of the, of the spiritual world is a realm of eternal spiritual romance and of selfless loving exchanges. To enter the realm of pure love, we must begin here and now in the material world to become pure, unmotivated servants. Any egocentric motivation disqualifies us. Because to experience divine love, we must feel joy in denying our own appetites for pleasure of the loved one. For the pleasure of the loved one. We, let me repeat that. Because to experience divine love, we must feel joy in denying our own appetite for the pleasure of the loved one. We do not lose our own identity in the process. On the contrary, our true identity expands as we render service. And each expression of self selfishness, each expansion of selflessness intensifies our capacity. On the contrary, our true identity expands as we render service and each expression of selflessness intensifies our capacity to experience even more vast dimensions of love. When we are motivated by genuine love to act so selflessly, even more love is available to us. 
Um, this is the end of the chapter, What is Love in Spiritual Warrior 2, Chapter 2. Um, I know it covered a lot, but I feel those who have ears will hear, <laughs> and the Lord in everybody's heart can help us. If it has awakened in you, which it has in me in studying this, a desire, the desire to be, to, to offer genuine love and to understand what it be. And for me to hopefully experience it, understand it, grasp it this lifetime. So uh, that's the end of the chapter. Are there any questions, comments? Question from um, someone who's new to the show called Long Lost Servant. Long Lost Servant? All right. And Where are they? Did they say their location? Okay. Um, this person says, I'm suffering from schizophrenia, but I don't really know what devotees would recommend in terms of how to manage it in regards to the cultivation of Krishna Bhakti. Um, my only recommendation because uh, this is a class on spiritual warriorship and I don't feel qualified to go into um, that type of response I hope that I don't know where you are your location to possibly seek professional help. I tell you what I found, I don't know what my mental condition was when I came, but reading Bhagavad Gita, Krishna is, of course, the top psychologist, psychiatrist, and he helps us, I found, help me and many other people. If you could study that and find someone in your community who is also spiritually orientated and study together or if you know that you have this condition um, seek more professional help I hope that satisfies you if not maybe you can write to me offline and we can talk more about that and, um, He's saying, Speaker. He's saying um, has anyone heard from our dear friend Bhuvan Mohan? He says, I understand he's back in the hospital and he's wondering if you know how he's doing. No. He was here last week. He greeted me. I have not spoken to him during the week. And usually he stays in touch with me. I have not heard that. And I will try to reach out and find him. Thank you. No questions. Okay. Um, okay. What I'd like to do is share a question. As I said before, every after every class and lecture, Bhakti Tirtha Swami would have questions and he gives answers. And I found at the end of this chapter there was a question um, that may be helpful. Again, I'm not sure. But let's try. The question is, you talk about the material world and the spiritual world. What is the relationship between the two? His answer. We can learn a great deal about the spiritual realm by examining the material world which is a reflection of the genuine kingdom of God. Even though this reflection is a perverted one, who is that? As above, so below. 
Most of us, at one time or another, have experienced uplifting associations with other people. Because these encounters are so wonderful, our thoughts become preoccupied with the person we are with. And we yearn to be in that individual's company again. Sometimes our daydreams were so blissful that they carried us through many dull, boring, or painful periods in our lives. And I think we can all kind of relate to a situation like that. In a similar way, when we encounter difficulties in material life, we can remind ourselves that our original constitutional position is in the spiritual kingdom. An abode of pure, unending love and devotion. Our awareness of the joys of spiritual realization can help us more through the temptations and difficulties that we have to experience at this person at this time. Even a single day, a, a single week, or single year can seem endless when things are not going well. But from the vantage point of eternity, this lifetime is just a small distraction, a temporary blip. Once we're back in the spiritual kingdom, the countless years that we have passed in lower realms of existence will merely seem like flickering moments of a nightmare. So, if we are suffering, experiencing difficulties far greater than we can bear, we can make eternal life a point of reference and almost laugh at our troubles. And the way to do that again is as he stated in another part we read is your association if you're associating with other spiritual seeking people or self-realized or endeavoring for self-realization and you're reading about God hearing about God these things you build that up in your mind and you begin to realize that there's more than this material world because it isn't our home and there's more beyond but we have to hear about it talk about it imbibe it he says we can remind ourselves that at some point in our evolution we will have a chance to become pure so that all our present problems will vanish just as nightmares eventually do. It is as if we were in the spiritual world now, but dozed off for a while. The experience of nodding off is what we are now undergoing in this material world, which seems filled with never ending complications, miseries, and challenges. We can change our experience by turning away from relative material concerns and understanding more about transcendental love, which we can only appreciate as we deepen our knowledge of the soul. Again, knowledge is important. Knowledge of the soul. And when I get to that, I usually refer people to Bhagavad Gita as it is by Srila Prabhupada, chapter 2. Because we get the Arjuna is miserable. He doesn't want to fight. He doesn't want to go to the battlefield. He's throwing his weapons down. It could be more. 
worried in that. And then he's worried about what will happen to the women and the children. He has a lot on his mind. And yet, Krishna is there. And he begins, the first thing he begins to tell him, you don't know the difference between the material and the spiritual. Let me tell you, boy. And then he begins to describe the soul. So this is important. We, the knowledge we get will help us to understand. Because as I'm reading this, I'm saying, hmm, somebody's saying, what are you talking about? How's that going to happen? But it's possible if you desire to be a more loving person and to have that love reciprocated to you. We can change our experience by turning away from relative material concerns and understanding more about transcendental love, which we can only appreciate as we deepen our knowledge of the soul. As we elevate our consciousness and become more transcendental than all our current difficulties in the material world will fade into insignificance. How is that? A good spot to end? Any questions, comments? What time is it? Just let me give you one more question and then we'll be finished with this chapter and we'll look forward to the School of Love next week. This question, to what extent do our attitudes toward money mm, influence our attitudes toward love? Okay, stop now, right? You're just fussing, you're not bringing home any money, what are you going to do? Okay, but, uh, listen. He has an answer. This is a nice question because it has a lot to do with contemporary society. People who are unwilling to give financially probably will not give in other ways either. Finances are just one aspect of a deep or problem. Those who refuse to share their money with their mates are most likely selfish in other aspects of their relationship. In a marriage, spouses should be generous with each other, considering everything as belonging to God and therefore to their partners as well. She, God has to be a part of our lives every day, every moment, every time. We have all heard the saying, money is the honey. But actually, apart from what it symbolizes, money itself has little to do with love. Although it can be a source of frustration that interferes with one's expression of love. Divorce often occurs because of financial problems and worries about money can cause tension in a family to the point that people cannot share their higher love. A husband and wife can focus so much on the mortgage. Oh. For instance, and for insurance or the car that they forgot about, that they forget about love and service. Communication disintegrates because each person is distracted thinking, two more days then I've got to make the car payment. And this doesn't mean you walk away from your responsibilities. Again, referring to um, Bhagavad Gita, 
9.22 where Krishna says, uh, fix your mind on me, uh, think of me without deviation. And I, I, I carry what you lack and preserve what you have. I mean, there's Krishna, God himself, telling us if we think on him. And this whole chapter is about keeping God in the center and allowing God to reciprocate to our love and our caring. And here it's even saying, even with your finances, you give some of that. And, of course, it's hard if you're really entangled in the mortgage and the insurance and the car payment. But if you have God in the center, those things are there. But you don't let that be take your mind off. He states, a relationship is not deep if a couple can only function when everything is going well. The real tests come as difficulties arise. When both parties have the greatest need to receive love and to feel love. Some people will allow problems to drive them further apart. But those who are truly loving will bond together even more. Trying to be more selfless and denying themselves for each other. A woman might choose to not get a new dress so that her husband can get a new pair of pants. A father might choose to not get a car because he wants his child to go to a special school. Such sacrifices, which are expressions of love, help foster strong close relationships and just reading this I feel in this time of the headline saying financial crisis it's a mess out there and many people are losing their jobs being fired and the health insurance the whole thing but what he's saying even with those difficulties in relationships they 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 can be test as to the, the strength of the love. And we've gotten many techniques, technologies, hopefully understanding of strong love relationships so that we can move through these difficulties because as long as we're in the material world, we're going to have difficulties. But he's also spoken to us of how the objective, the goal, can be towards getting out while we're dealing with the difficulties. And that's the whole idea of studying spiritual warriorship. No questions? All right. Thank you all for being there. Hare Krishna. Next week, the School of Love. Hare Krishna. Good night. Hmm?